Well, welcome back to State of the Union. Lord Dunlop, we're very pleased to speak to you again. Um, we're talking about your Constitution Committee's report uh, into the future of the Union. This is the first big report that the Committee has done since just before Brexit. So can you give us a sense of the main findings and conclusions that you reached? Well, I think what the report is all about is, is how we kind of reset the relationships between the UK government and the other governments within the United Kingdom. And uh, our theme, our central theme, is that we think the future of the union is as a cooperative and respectful union. So that is the key theme. And I think what we've done is take a step back and try and look at the subject of the health of the union, taking a kind of, you know, that Radio 4 phrase, taking the long view, because I think you're apt to get sort of wrapped into, it's all about Scotland, it's all about Scottish independence, but actually it's much broader than that. And, and the roots of some of the stresses and strains that uh, we can see within the union go back much, much longer. Uh, we've had a huge number of big issues that would test any governing arrangements, whether it's the financial crash, climate change, Brexit and COVID. These have all um, created their own stresses and strains. And our governing uh, institutions have had to deal with the cumulative impact of all of those. So um, we're really providing, I think, some very practical recommendations about how we can strengthen those relationships and to do so in a timely fashion. So we have um, not said that what is required is a, is a big all encompassing radical restructuring of the constitution because we feel actually our uh, constitution, our unwritten constitution, one of its great strengths is its ability to adapt to change. And obviously we feel that there are changes that are required. Uh, and uh, one of the things that came out strongly in our report is there is this issue about regional economic inequality and that actually uh, economies grow more strongly when they grow more evenly. And all the international evidence is that when they grow more evenly, it's because power isn't centralized at the center. And the UK is one of the most centralized states in the developed world. So we come out very strongly for uh, devolution in England. And as you have more devolution, uh, if you like, the, the, the connections between the different governments within the United Kingdom need strengthening. So we very much welcome the reforms to intergovernmental relations that the UK government has agreed with the devolved governments. Uh, and we will be watching very carefully uh, as, a, as a sort of parliament and as a constitution committee to make sure that those reforms are followed through. So you talk in the report about, uh, and you just mentioned there, that, that there isn't a call for a big bang uh, set of changes to, to the UK. That's in contrast to some, um, including on the Labour side, who've called for constitutional conventions and potential big changes to, to structures. Does that mean that you and your committee think that the current structures are fit for purpose and don't need radical change to continue to uh, have popular consent? Well, I think what's interesting about this report is it's obviously a cross-party report. So it's not just sort of conservatives on it. You know, there are very senior uh, ex-Labour ministers on it, Lib Dems and cross cross benches. And um, I think what we are saying is that you can get very focused on structures, but actually what matters more is culture and attitudes. And therefore we feel with the, the sort of changes that we're recommending in the report, that actually that gives the best chance of those attitudes being more constructive uh, because that's overwhelmingly what the evidence says that people in this country want. So it's about culture rather than structures. And, you know, whether it's, we can come on to talk about the Sewell Convention or intergovernmental relations. There are a lot of people think that actually um, you need to have that policed by the courts, but actually this is about managing political relationships. And therefore that is best policed by parliament and the devolved legislatures uh, working more closely together rather than having the courts adjudicating on things 
that are very much should be in the political space. So on the Sewell Convention, one of the things that the report look, looks into is the, the evolution of the devolved settlements. And Sewell came about in a time when Labour administrations were uh, in place in Wales, Scotland and at the UK level. Do you think that one of the issues we face now is that for purely political purposes, Sewell Conventions don't, don't make sense any longer? No, I, I don't agree that they don't make sense uh, any any longer. Um, I mean, I think for 20 plus years, um, the Sewell Convention actually worked um, very well. And if you look at our report, we have an appendix that gives all the kind of detail on, on that. Um, as you know, uh, Anthony, you know better than anybody else. I mean, what the Sewell Convention says is the UK government or the UK parliament should not normally legislate uh, in devolved areas without the consent of the devolved legislatures. And I think not normally is doing a lot of work in, in, in that sort of phrase. <clears throat> so where is Sewell broken down? It's broken down during the Brexit process, which was not a normal event. It's a, a sort of once in a generation type uh, event. And so I think we as a committee uh, believe that it is possible to re-establish trust in the Sewell Convention. We say that very clearly in, in the report. And I think what we find encouraging is that there is evidence emerging now that the UK government is working very hard to uh, re-establish what went before, i.e. respect for the Sewell Convention. And let me just give you one uh, small example. Um, I mean, I think the House of Lords was very concerned about the UK Internal Market Bill because, if you like, that was the first domestic bill where the UK government didn't get legislative consent. But since then, um, they have worked very hard with the devolved governments to <clears throat> come up with some compromises uh, that mean that common frameworks, uh, if they are agreed between the governments, then if you like the teeth of the UK internal market bill uh, won't apply in those areas. Uh, you know, so that allows for the regulatory divergence uh, to, to occur as it has done in the past, but in a, in a managed way. So that's a very, very good sign that um, cooperative working is beginning to be re-established. When we last spoke to you uh, in March uh, of last year, it was uh, around the time that there was speculation building about your the publication of your report into how the UK government should uh, operate itself uh, on issues relating to the union. Are you um, happy with the progress that's been made since that report was published? Yes, I am. I mean, it hasn't uh, implemented everything that I recommended in quite the way that I recommended, um, but it has um, implemented the vast majority of the recommendations I, I made. And I obviously made some uh, pretty significant uh, recommendations in the area of intergovernmental relations. And if you like, that was the missing piece when we last spoke. Uh, and now the government has addressed that. And I think you know, most uh, independent commentators that has looked at the package that has come out uh, has been quite impressed. Uh, and it has got the support of the Welsh First Minister and indeed Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland. I think the key thing is now to, to build on that. And, you know, the proof of the pudding will be in, in the eating. You know, the structures are good, the processes are good, but how, how will it be operated? And will it move from being a forum for managing differences and even a platform for accentuating those differences into becoming a genuine um, uh, forum where joint policy initiatives are taken and decisions are taken, because that will give vitality and life uh, to, to this whole area. And I think will make a huge difference to the overall sense of trust and confidence in how the UK has been governed. Um, talk, and, uh, sorry, sorry, you go ahead, Fraser. I was going to take back to the, the 
point about um, uh, the Sewell Convention. And one of the things that comes out in the report is the sense that the House of Lords could play a strengthened role uh, in acting as a sort of early warning system and um, understanding where there might be issues during the process of a bill and not merely at the final stage. Um, do you see that that role as coming from the fact that the Lords can perhaps be seen as a, a slightly more neutral broker? Is, are you trying to suggest that the Lords uh, can help facilitate um, some more of the thorny aspects of intergovernmental relations? Yes, I think I think not exclusively, but I think I think for, for the reasons that you suggested, I think, yes, yes, we can. And I mean, we've already um, played that role in, in, in the past when Brexit was going through. I mean, there were changes. Uh, you may even have been a special advisor uh, working in government at the time for, for David Lidington, where there were amendments that were made. Uh, I, I forget, you know, the EU withdrawal bill. Um, there was great controversy over, over that, the freezing power and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and as a result of work done by the House of Lords, um, that was amended and it got the support of the Welsh government, if not the Scottish government. Um, so I think that illustrates that we can play that sort of role. And I thought what was very interesting as part of our inquiry is that we reached out to um, all the devolved legislatures. We went to Edinburgh to meet the Scottish Parliament, Wales to meet the Welsh Assembly and interacted with the Northern Ireland Assembly. And is that there is a great appetite um, in those institutions to actually work more closely with us. And although there's lots of political rhetoric about the House of Lords, actually behind the scenes, the fact that we're not uh, on the front line of the party political battle every day, um, but can take the time to dig into these issues, I think is uh, seen as a very big plus point uh, in those uh, places. So yes, I do think we can play a big role, not, not exclusively, and I do think more transparency and scrutiny of these issues will improve the overall outcomes. Um, could, I, could I ask you, Andrew, about um, England? Because one of the things that came out of the, the report in some detail was the anticipation that levelling up um, and how England's uh, structures in terms of mayoralties and local devolution deals is, is in part uh, an answer to um, having a more balanced union. What, what is it that you would want to see in the future levelling up white paper that would really facilitate that? Well, I think ambition, that, 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 that's the key thing. Uh, and um, I, I think, as I said at the beginning, you know, the UK is one of the most centralised states. And um, I think we received some very powerful uh, evidence from the local government uh, association, uh, a conservative and, and a labor uh, leader of that association. And, and both of them were saying the same thing, that actually, if you give us more, more power and uh, the resources to exercise those powers, then actually we can make, um, you know, public services better, money go further, and they had the evidence to, to back, back that up. So I would be looking for an ambitious leveling up paper uh, that isn't just about um, government doling out cash um, for local authorities to implement centrally decided priorities, but much more flexibility so that uh, local authorities, mayoralties, combined authorities, can plan on a multi-year basis and can also um, shift money between budget heads to achieve better outcomes in a particular lo locality. Because often if you're trying to tackle a big public policy issue, it's not just about education or it's not just about infrastructure, it's not just about health, it, it, it's a combination of all of them. And giving these authorities properly accountable to their, you know, local electorates, uh, more flexibility in that area, I think, could produce um, better results. And we saw that during COVID. I mean, uh, track and trace, originally very centralised, but actually, you know, the effectiveness of track, track and trace depended hugely on sort of local know-how uh, and local relationships and connections. And so ambition, that's what I would like to see from this levelling up paper. And given that Michael Gove is in charge, uh, I think there's a good chance of that. As always with these things, you know, will the Treasury 
properly fund it? Uh, will they let go of the purse strings sufficiently to make sure that this initiative makes a big difference? Um and on a slightly different tangent, um, the you said um, on the preparation for this report, you spoke with um, the Welsh uh, Parliament and the Scottish Parliament and, and colleagues across uh, the, the governments of the United Kingdom. In Wales at the moment, there is uh, a commission taking place looking at the constitution as well that the Welsh Labour government has, has set up, which is co-chaired by uh, Rowan Williams and Professor Laura McAllister. And they have said that um, potentially independence uh, should be reviewed as part of that process. Is that something you think the UK government should engage in to give the counter argument to um, you know, to, to the people that will argue that Welsh independence is now worthy of consideration by the Welsh government? Well, I think I would be disturbed if the Senate, you know, was spending a lot of its time thinking about independence for Wales, because I think that's a complete distraction on what should be the priorities for the country at this moment in time. And, you know, so I think that about Wales, uh, as I do about uh, Scotland. Uh, so I hope um, that uh, if they are going to consider that issue, that they, um, you know, get evidence from, you know, the side of the debate that thinks it would be a distraction and actually that thinks the, 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 the union, if, if, if it didn't already exist, would be wanting to in, in, in invent it. Um, I can't speak for, you know, what the, the UK government uh, role in that would would be. Um, I was slightly surprised that that was in the terms of reference because I think it's about how do we work more closely together, not how do we pull pull apart at this time of great challenge. And the next decade uh, is going to be a very demanding one for the for the country. And you know, um, I, I've been in in and around politics for a long time. I can't remember a time when um, you know. The changes are so dramatic or happening at such unparalleled pace uh, and you know we we need to be focusing on the here and now uh, rather than you know constitutional bickering uh, you know because I think people want us to be focusing on the practicalities of how do we improve their their lives and I think this would be a complete distraction. On the um, the union itself, the report highlights a, a lack of overall coherence from successive governments that that you say have have undermined the strength of the union, and that the government needs a new vision for the twenty first century version of the union. Um, obviously, it's for the government to work out what that is. But what would your advice be about how to go about bringing that to life? Because it can quite often be seen in quite reductive ways as either about money or about more intervention or cooperation. What sort of vision could be put together to sell the union for the 21st century? Well, I, I always think, um, uh, you know, I mean, labels do 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 matter. And I think those on the other side of the debate have a very simple you know, label, which is independence. So I, I think, you know, I've called it a cooperative union. And I think we need some very uh, simple, understandable vision statement about what the union is all about. And I, I think a cooperative union really does sum, sum it up um, because you know, as I say, we're, we're, we're in a very challenging uh, world. And I think the, the union is a magnificent thing. It allows particular parts of the country to do things in a way that best suits them whilst coming together on issues of common interest to actually tackle them more effectively. And I think that is the heart of, of what the union is, is all about. And why does that work? Because it also links into the geographical fact that we live on quite a small island off the Western seaboard of Europe, but it also reflects the fact that of the, the ties of family and friendship that have grown up across the country over many years. And as I think we put it in the report, that that breeds a sort of empathy uh, that actually, you know, we 
we want to be part of the same future because we are experiencing the same things. Uh, we have sympathy, you know, when somebody in, in the Northeast is having problems finding a job or with their health. You know, people in Scotland or Wales and Northern Ireland experience at times exactly the same thing. And it is that sense of solidarity that I think needs to be at the heart uh, of any vision for, for the union. But you're right. You know, that sounds very highfalutin. And I think any successful vision for the union needs to relate it to the life experiences of every person that lives in this country. How is this going to secure the future for me and my family in the decades ahead? So it needs to be rooted in practical uh, examples of how this will impact on the everyday lives of people living uh, on this, these islands. And do you think that the, the structures that you proposed in your report and that the government have now implemented jointly with the devolved administrations can be a vehicle to have conversations about policy that actually affects people, even though it may be devolved? Because um, intergovernmental structures and relations have often been about um, the sorts of things that your report talks about, where is something devolved? Where does it need consent? Where are the, where are the lines? Whereas COVID has shown that public health doesn't respect national borders, even though there may be different policy decisions that can be taken. Do you think that uh, there should be an appetite to discuss shared policy areas, even while recognizing that the specific responsibility may not be reserved, it may, do, may be devolved? And do you pick up um, an appetite, including from the parliaments, as much as the governments themselves in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, to have a more UK wide discussion about things like that? Yeah, yes, I, 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 I do, actually. Uh, but again, you know, we'll have to test that in, in the months and years uh, ahead. But I think it's a two way street. And I think I think both sides need to be a little bit less sort of precious about these things. And I think one of the great benefits of devolution is because you're able to do things differently. You can sort of test the effectiveness of different approaches to different policy challenges and then learn um, from each other. And I think these new structures will be a great uh, framework for, for actually doing that. But, but I would like to see it becoming a less defensive exercise and actually identifying some real strands of policy that can become work streams that all the governments sign up to, to work together on. You know, climate change is a great example of that. You know, there is a, a kind of UK dimension to that, but, you know, how successful we are will depend on what happens on the ground locally. So that would be a great one. And, and I think, you know, it's about start small and then build up from that. So identify two or three things that can become work streams for this, these new uh, arrangements and then build on their success because if you are successful in the first few initiatives you take, then that will breed confidence for, for the future. And it does come back to respect. Both sides have been guilty uh, at times of not respecting the other. And I think they both need to be more respectful of each other's responsibilities and recognize that when you come together, you can actually achieve far more. So that's what I would like to see uh, and I think it would be a very good start. Um, you know, I think the UK government needs to take a, a lead in this. Um, so, you know, the first meeting uh, of this new tier two, you know, because there's only um, a plenary once in a while, would be to really have a discussion about what are those policy areas that are going to become joint initiatives for, for all the governments then that should be published. There should be a debate about it in Parliament. There should be a de debate about it in all the devolved legislatures and actually engage the public in it because that's the way we'll get these institutions um, working properly, being a vital part of our constitution. So let's wait and see. But, um, you know, what I'm hearing is, is some good things about policy areas. I mean, let's see what happens on free ports. 
will free ports fly if that's not a contradiction in terms in Scotland? Uh, I hope so. If they do, then that will be a good sign. This is all heading in the right direction. And just finally, given that trust and cooperation is such a theme of everything that's recommended for intergovernmental relations, um, that trust has collapsed between the Scottish Conservatives and the Central Party. Um, how damaging is that to the broader cause of unionism when unionist parties fall out in the public and quite unpleasant way that has happened over the last couple of a couple of weeks? And can you see a way back for that relationship for as long as Douglas Ross and Boris Johnson both hold their positions? Gosh, you're asking me a really tricky, tricky question there. Um, I mean. Uh, it's certainly not helpful, is it? You know, uh, I mean, if, if you support the union, um, you want political parties that range across the union. Uh, and I certainly do not advocate that the response to this um, falling out is that there should be a, a new centre-right party. And we haven't got time to go into all the re reasons for that. Um, you know, I, I'm on public record uh, about the Prime Minister's position uh, and um, I, I certainly think he should be thinking hard about his position and I'm very confident that by the time we get to the, the, the general election this may not be the problem as appears now.